And then ending here with some images of the Jefferson School, the teachers who are here who are teaching, but also the children, and the aspect of family life within these photographs. Today we're going to visit an organization whose mission is to preserve and honor the rich legacy of the African-American community of Charlottesville and Albemarle. Join us as we talk with Andrea Douglas, Executive Director for the Jefferson School African-American Heritage Center. Come on. Andrea, tell us more about the mission of the center and why this work is so important in our community. Well, the mission of the African American Heritage Center is um, to first uh, highlight the contributions of the African American people of Charlottesville and Albemarle County to the history of this area. And then also to highlight the um, contributions of people of color, of the diaspora, both locally, nationally, and internationally to the fabric of our community, meaning to, to America. Um, and so our goal here is to really define and describe the cultural and historical production of people of color. This community had a African American school as early as 1865. And so the value of education, the value of community is instilled here from that moment. And so this institution exists to inform people about that. But it's also to talk about how do we understand the fabric of American life? How do we understand the ways in which people have integrated into that American life? Right. And creating a space that meets the intellectual capacity of the people who live here. How did it come to be, the, the idea of the center? I mean, mm -hmm. Where did it start? Well, the center becomes a, a subject in 2000. The school system in Charlottesville needed some repair here and there, and the question was, could they afford to do it? And the answer was no. They could not afford to repair this school. And you know, the school's life, it comes here in 1894. It is a high school in 1926. It becomes the African American Elementary School in 1951. It is the site of complete integration of the schools. And so it's had a really long life as a building. And so the question then becomes, what do you do with it? Right. So the school board deeded the building to the city. The city then went through a process of trying to understand what to do with it in its entire process of looking at West Main Street. Um, they did a study, a Tordi Gala study, and the recommendation was that this re become commercial property. And that caused an alarm. <laughs> the people in Star Hill who lived close to here said, you can't do this. This is the last remnant of the African-American community, physical remnant of that history. Also, um, the parents whose kids had gone to the preschool or whose families had gone to the school in the 60s said, no, this is a significant site for our community. And then the alumni who had gone to school here were um, engaging and planning for their own uh, reunion at that time. And so these seemingly disparate groups come together. And the way it's described to me was this is, they had a meeting and they were all sitting around in a circle at uh, the James Madison Library downtown. And they're all sitting around in a circle and starting to sort of talk about their memories of Jefferson. And there were similar memories, different memories, but all of them really sort of expressing a real true love for the place. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Nancy O'Brien uh, said to me once that this was the, the biggest pep rally for Jefferson she'd ever been to. And so over the course of the next five years, from 2000 to 2005, they created the Citizens for Jefferson that then lobbied the city to create a task force. The task force then went around and looked at what this building could be, and the decision was made that it should be a center for community education. And the Heritage Center is pretty much what they asked for. You know, um, The city center is pretty much what they asked right. for. Right, so this whole building has how many, how many different organizations? There are nine. nine. You know, yeah. and, 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 and that's a lot. That's a lot going on. It is a lot going on. And, you know, I often say that if you wanted to think about a site unlike any other site in Charlottesville, this is in fact that. Because you can come here at 7 in the morning and not leave until 11 o'clock at night. 
The other thing about it is, is this notion of adjacencies, right? If I want to have a conversation, if I have an idea, and I want to go bounce it off someone who's doing something somewhat similar but not at all similar to what I want right, to do, right. or if I want to expand a program, all I have to do is walk out the door. Yeah, I know, you that's know? great. Pass you in the hall picking up the mail. And so what we've been able to do is create a facility that then allows people easily to come and extend their programs. It's yeah. The auditorium is a state-of-the-art surround sound theater. We have the ability to um, do distance conversations because of the capacity of technology that we put into the space. And so our desire is to participate in large conversations. And we created a space that gives us the capacity to do it. There are a number of images that were created by soldiers. And this is William Scott, who was enslaved here in, 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 in Virginia. And he was 14 years old. He heard the Union soldiers passing through, and he decided to run away. Families photographs, you know, a man with his children, this is who he's fighting for, and the freedom of others. And but we can begin to see why it was important for them to visit the photographic studio. Let's talk to, we're in this, this lovely space, then there is the current exhibit is up. Mm -hmm. Talk about this exhibit. Um, this is a selection of works from a larger exhibition called Core Peak. Um, that a very good friend of mine, Kendall Messick, began the body of work in 1995 and finished about 2002. And it chronicles the lives of a community um, in North Carolina. And it's, it's a story that wants to describe the way in which a community changes. Because mm -hmm. like lots of Southern communities, they're agricultural communities. And as the younger people begin to search for jobs and opportunities in other places, they leave a community behind, you know? And, right. and sometimes what's left are the elderly and the young. And so this is a really sort of poetic essay about that community. And bringing it here, thinking about the history of Charlottesville, thinking about the African-American community in Charlottesville, thinking about the transience of that community, because when emancipation occurs, there are 15,000 people of color living in this area. And this then, these numbers now have dwindled to you know, just under 5,000. So we can talk about a similar kind of transition. Mm -hmm. And that's what we do here. We try and talk about history in a contemporary way so that it has resonance and so that the lives of those people that we are working to bring to light and their contributions become contemporary conversations. What are some of the other events that have taken place here already? Well, we did a second line. And how I got to that was I spent a lot of time in New Orleans for a little while. And second lines are the most African tradition in America. And they come out of um, family ritual. And when they are done in New Orleans, they were associated with funerals. Mm -hmm. And out of that grew um, social groups. And out of that grew a music tradition. And so we're interested in transitions and how to create transitions and talking about how things change. So we brought Corey Harris because he won a MacArthur. And when you win a MacArthur, your peers have said that you're the person who has made changes to a genre. Right. right. So the genre of blues and his work there. We did a hip hop film series, five days of that, where we're looking at hip hop from a global perspective. And even in America, religious hip hop, Christian hip hop. Right. And how does the, the language of women and cars and, 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 and jewelry translate to other ideas? You know, so those, those are the kinds of things that really drive us. And then today, what is happening today? Well, today is um, a conversation with Deborah Willis. Deborah Willis is considered one of the hundred more important people in American photography. She is the author of almost every book. I won't say every book, but if she's not authored it, she's being quoted in one. 
about African American photography. And so she um, has been working or worked on a book called Envisioning Emancipation. And so she's here doing a talk about this. And this book essentially chronicles images of African Americans post emancipation to the 1930s, the New Deal. And so what's important about this book for us, again, is she's the expert. And so this whole aspect of what happens after emancipation, such as the Jefferson School, why this place is important, why it's important in terms of preserving memory and preserving the stories and the narratives and collecting these images. This is Emancipation Day, 1905. But here in the Rappahannock River, we can see all of the aspects that they're walking with. They have bundles, they have furniture, and they're moving forward moving with their families. So what do you see for this permanent installation? Well, what we're after is to tell the modern history of Charlottesville. Where we are, you can go to Monticello, you can go to the university, you can go to Montpelier, Ashlon, mm -hmm. and you've got your colonial history. Right? The question is, where do you go for your modern history? Right. right. Certainly the historical society and the university are places that you can go. But in terms of a, temp, a permanent installation that looks at Charlottesville's development post-emancipation and talks about the ways in which these were fluid societies until a moment in time, 1924, when they write, the way they, when Virginia creates the Racial Integration Act, which we will have a copy of here. There's significant things that happen here. And so we don't just look at it as thinking about the Jefferson School history. We think about it as writing the modern history of this locality of Virginia and of America. You yeah. know, massive resistance happens here. Yeah. You know, they close the schools here. We open them, but we're the first to close them, and we're the first to open them. So within that year period, there are things that occur here that are impactful for the larger story. And yeah. so that's what we're we're planning on offering and doing it through the voices of people who went to school here. That's exciting. Andrea, thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. I appreciate your listening. <laughs>